Well, it's great to have such a good crowd here. This is uh, wonderful. I know uh, I'm going to be introducing Dr. Szymanski, the Deputy Director of the Office of Ag Policy, um, part of the State Department. And her, oper her office operates uh, trade negotiations and disputes um, with agricultural products, food safety issues, and food policy. Um, so some of the things that um, she does, and I'm sure she'll probably touch on some of these today, maybe not all of them, um, is advocating for science-based regulatory systems, harmonization of some of the international standards, um, challenging some of the barriers to agricultural trade, and promoting open trade um, of staple food commodities. So I, I looked on the website, Marcella, I did my mm -hmm. homework, and so some of the major efforts right now are going, going on are in Trans-Pacific Partnerships, which U.S. Uh, partners with about 11 partners to the west, mm -hmm. and also um, a uh, transatlantic trade policy in which the U.S. works with the EU. Mm -hmm. And the other important one that was mentioned was coffee, and I think we can all agree on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Marcella got her master's or her bachelor's degree in forestry at University of Georgia, her master's degree um, at Oklahoma State University in forest genetics. Come on in, there's plenty of chairs and room in front. Um, and then her PhD here um, in natural resource economics uh, with Dr. Coletti. So um, she's one of our very famous alumni. So she began her career at University of Kentucky, working with teaching and extension and went off to the State Department of the Pakistan uh, desk office in 2005 and currently serves as the deputy director. So Joe, I don't know if you want to add any of that, any to that, but um, we're uh, very pleased to welcome you here, Marcella, and we're really interested in your talk. So please help me welcome Thank you. I'm Marcella Shemansky, and I am a former ISU grad now, I got into the policy process through the uh, um, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Now, I never realized when I got in that the State Department would ever have an office that deals with agricultural policy. I mean, who would think that and why do we have it? I'll touch on that as kind of as we go through the presentation. But really, we're, we're looking around the world and when we deal with, um, I should have put that GMO in quotes, um, but when we're dealing with genetic engineering, we're dealing with a regulated technology. So what other countries do, what we do with it in terms of regulation, if those are different, then we have trade problems. I wanted to ask a question. So who in this audience feels passionately against genetic engineering or GMOs in food? We have one person. How many of you feel strongly for genetic engineering? A few. How many of you feel, well, I don't know. I don't really think about it. A few. So, you know, there's a mix in opinions. And it's very interesting that when we think about agriculture, we really don't, you know, you hear about the GMO debate, but really in agriculture, there's a lot of uh, discussion on should it be regulated, should it be not be regulated. Well, it's regulated. So let me ask all of you, because you guys are the brightest and the best, I know because you're at ISU, what do all these in, have in common? Anyone? What do all these foods have in common? Some GMO Nope. Consumed by infants? Consumed by infants? Oh, humans. Yes. Anybody else? What's that? DNA. They all have DNA. Yes. And something else. Well, oh, they're all food. None of these products would be approved today if held to the same standard as biotechnology. All of these are potential allergen. Wheat allergen, peanut allergen, kiwi. Some people are allergic to that and, and milk as well. That's one of the things when you regulate biotechnology, the Food and Drug Administration is looking, is it a potential allergen? 
So this is one of the most regulated agricultural products we have on the market. Um, we have the American Medical Association, the FDA, Japan, Brazil, 28, 27 other countries, independent organizations like the World Health Organization, all saying the products on the market produced through genetic engineer engineering are safe. But that hasn't stopped a polarization from happening. You know, it's today when we talk about um, where we get our information, it's a very different source of when we talked about 20 years ago. My son, a 10-year-old son said to me when I said, oh, you know, we got to look this up in the library. He said, Mom, that's so old school. Everybody uses the Internet. And I said, oh, my gosh, I'm so old. But now we have something called the tweetification of risk. You know, old school of risk, you have a hazard times exposure, and that will give you risk. I have water, it has a certain hazard, and a risk factor. You know, arsenic, less amounts, risky. So everything has a risk. That's old school. And now we have all kinds of disruptive technologies. Facebook, Periscope, <coughs> Twitter. And by disruptive, I don't mean bad. I mean... This is something that changes the way we fundamentally do things. How we get our information, how we communicate, the way we do our jobs, even as researchers. So now we have a new school of risk. And the new school of risk is hazard times media exposure equals perception of risk. Perception drives policy. You know, when you think back to 20 years ago, we had a very different type of thinking about science. This is the picture of the map in terms of urban and rural areas. But think about, this is in 1950. In 1950, look at the areas that are in, uh, sorry, the areas in pink are greater than 75% urban. The area in um, yellow is 50 to 75%. The area in blue is 25 to 50% urban. And the area in green is less, is less than 25%. So there's not a lot of urban areas. 1950s, think 1960s. Now, there's a lot of young people in this room, but there's some of us that remember going to the moon and remember, when you talk about science and food, I wanted those squeezy little things like the astronaut had, you know, they were eating up in space. It was so cool. Fast forward to where we are right now, about right here on this map, and some will say, you did what to our food? So very different shifting perceptions about food. Okay, that's where we are in 1950. Let me fast forward to you and watch 1960, you see more and more areas that are become becoming urban. This is about where we are right now. And I will fast forward it even further and you'll see there's almost no areas that are less than 50% of the population. Everybody is going to be urban. What does this mean? This means that you have a growing population that aren't connected to food. They're not growing the food. But we all eat and we all want to be connected. You see that in the slow food movement. People want to be connected to their food. So let's look, give you a, a little bit of consumer attitudes from the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. And some of you may be familiar with this data. So, 38% of consumers trust the government, not good for the State Department. 49% say agriculture is on the wrong track, and 33% say media gets it, the facts right. So if you can't trust the government, you're not sure about agriculture, and you know the media's got it wrong, who are you going to trust? Where do you get your information from? So that's part of this perception, because 
Who are you talking to? You're not talking to farmers. So let me give you a little exercise in policy and perception. How many of you can definitely see these wavy lines I put up here? Can everyone see them? Everyone? Anybody see anything different? Everybody can see those. Okay, good. So there is a definite difference between how people wish food is produced and how it's actually produced. Very different. This, by the way, is dog food. All right, so getting back to my lines. Well, I just told you as a policy, these are wavy lines. Well, I lied. These are, in fact, straight lines. But this is the point. Perception drives policy. And everyone in this room just collectively agreed they were wavy lines and therefore it's so. And this is the discussion we are having about agriculture in general and genetic engineering. We're having a discussion that's meaning some of these technologies are going to be taken off the table. Right now we have conversations around, the only thing you hear from um, in the media are things like food poisoning. You know, you're not, you, hear, you have health scares and scary but healthy. This could have been my colleague's daughter, who isn't the most adventure, venture of, um, of eating food. You know, we have to teach food doesn't have to be scary. We don't want food to be scary. Think about this example of pink slime. Who knows what pink slime is? What's pink slime? Tell me. It's a leftover from meat production. Yes. It's also called lean, finely textured beef. And in 2012, you started seeing in the media this being played, pink slime. We're feeding our kids in cafeterias pink slime. It had a huge yuck factor to it. But pink slime has something in common with Belgium, and that's 400 million. Without leanly, finely textured beef, 400 pounds of beef would be disposed of as waste each year. That's about the same amount of waste of, of, of what's wasted in Belgium each year. So think about it. How are we talking about this topic? Is it we're talking about reducing food waste, or we're talking about pink slime? How we talk about things in agriculture matters. Who knows how we get a seedless watermelon? You guys, some of you might be agronomists. Anyone? Well, we take a watermelon, and we treat that watermelon with colchicine. That's a natural, natural plant extract. It's also, by the way, highly toxic and mutagenic. And eventually, you get a plant with three sets of chromosomes who's so screwed up that it can't produce seed, and that's the one you eat. Am I trying to make you afraid of agriculture? No, of course not. I'm trying to say there's a lot that goes on in agriculture that people don't think about. I mean, in agriculture, we're trying to solve hard problems, usually. We're trying to solve problems of disease. Or we're trying to say, can we make something that consumers would want more? And if they don't want it, then it won't be sold on the market. But for all of you in this room, either you're social scientists, or your, your economists, or you, know, you may be a researcher, we all have to do a better job of helping people understand risks. So this is a chart from um, a colleague in Oxford. And it's relating cancer and different types of, of foodborne diseases with actual diseases. So 56,000 dying of cancer. How many of genetic engineering? None. You know, we think about usually the way people, in terms of risk uh, perception, we think about big types of events. We can wrap our head around that. And, but things that are every day, it's hard to wrap our head around that. Things like choking or, or falling out of a chair. So we have to think about risk in context. 
I don't really like flying. And that's always in my head, like when I was flying down here, thinking about what gives public outcry. But what I really should have been thinking about is that that donut that I ate, because there's heart disease in my, my family, and that's my actual hazard. So the difference between risk and the perception of risk is the difference between whether we're going to have an action or whether we're going to react. And so you have a lot of reaction happening around food. So why would somebody from the State Department really care about this issue? Well, for, for the State Department, it's an economic security issue. We have 150 billion of ag exports going around the world. And probably about 60, 70 percent of these are produced through biotechnology in one way or another. But it's also a food security issue. There are solutions to drought, drought tolerance. There are disease resistant problems. For example, in uh, Nigeria, the uh, cassava mosaic uh, virus, the only solution happens to be a biotech solution. So there are food security issues as well. And the third, it's a national security issue. I don't know, we have, like I said, a lot of young people, but in 2008, do you, anybody remember prices just rising all over, even in the U.S.? If you went to the Sam's Club, you might not have been able to buy rice. Why? Because countries put export bans. Um, in Haiti, the prime minister lost his job because of riots. So quickly, the government and governments around the world realize that this is a national security issue. But let me talk a little bit about agriculture in context of, the, of, of a global um, use. So agriculture uses 16 million kilometers of land. That's about the size of South, South America. That's cropland. Add pasture land, that's another 32 million square kilometers. Forty percent of the land mass is in agriculture. So we got to have a discussion on agriculture. We definitely do because we also have to deal with climate change and all the other global challenges. Agriculture is also one of um, the leading, well, I wouldn't say leading, but it, it produces a substantial amount of greenhouse gases. 25% come out of agriculture. This is a picture of the Aral Sea. Watch what's happening over time from 73 as it dries up. So agriculture uses 70% of the world's water. It's hard to wrap your head around that. But if you think about the Empire State Building, take 7,000 Empire State Buildings filled with water, and that's what we use every day. Enormous amount of water. So agriculture has, is, you might say, part of the problem. We've got to find a solution in agriculture. population is going to be hitting somewhere around probably around 10 billion, 9 to 10 billion as we get to 2050, then it's going to peak off at 11 billion. And there's a very interesting story in population growth that I'm going to tell you at the end that's actually critical to decisions we make today. So think of how big is this challenge. We're going to have to produce in the next 40 years, 50 years, as much as we've produced in the last 10,000. Can you imagine, as in the last 10,000 years? We all need to eat, and yet 800 million don't have enough food today. So if we have a table of eight people, one, somebody's going to go to bed hungry. It's very hard to, to think about that and wrap your head around the number, too. So look at, if you look at this chart, this whole area in orange represents the number of deaths, 9 million a year from hunger and malnutrition. Now, if you remember the earthquake in Haiti, it's over on the other side in yellow. That was awful and horrible. And it's hard to imagine that even as horrible as that is, there's also these 9 million deaths going on. So we need 60%. This is according to the Food and Agricultural Organization by 2050. 
We've got to do this using less land, less water, less fertilizer, and fewer pesticides. In essence, we got to be sustainability, uh, su sustainable. Because as Norman Borlaug said, he said, I don't see the remaining, at his time when he made this quote, there were six billion, and he, and he said, we need enough you know, for, for eight billion, or sorry, we have enough for three billion. I don't see three other billion volunteering not to eat. So we've got to do this, and we've got to do it sustainability, sus sustainably. So we need science. And this is uh, data coming out of the USDA that's quite um, startling. From 1980 to 2011, just on corn, we've been able to produce uh, the same amount of corn using 40% less land, 60% less erosion, half the amount of water, almost half as less the amount of energy, and reduce greenhouse gases by 35%. Using precision farming, using traditional breeding, using um, all the tools available, including genetic engineering. It's not one tool, right? It's getting the right tool for the right, for the right place. This is where we are globally in terms of biotech crops. You'll see North America, South America, a little bit of Europe, hardly any in Africa, and Asia's adopting rapidly. My point of, on this is to really show you, how do I get the pointer? Look at where the, the arrow is, it's okay, look at where the arrow is. You'll see the red line, that's all the developing countries, the adoption rate. The blue line is industrial. Developing countries have surpassed developed countries in, ado in adoption. The reason is because farmers have seen the value of using the technology. It's solving problems for them. It's solving the problems of having to use um, chemicals that are very toxic and giving them alternatives. It's solving the problem of having to spray multiple times. Things like the BT crops where you, you don't have to spray as often. Um, and it's also giving them more money because they have to uh, less um, uh, resources put in, less inputs. But there's something interesting happening at the, at the same time that I talked about in the beginning. You have people saying, whoa, 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 what's going on? And this slow versus fast and competing world views is really playing out in different regulatory speeds. Remember, perception drives policy. So what Europe decides to do, and Europe, by the way, approves our products. Some countries in uh, Europe grow our products. The European Food Safety Authority says products are safe. But when it gets to the commission, it gets stuck. It goes nowhere. How does that affect us? That means a company can't get that product out to farmers in the ground. So it just stays there for years. Um, I think DuPont for years has been trying to get and finally did through the Europe um, high oleic acids. Those are things like um, in, in oil that's pretty much equivalent um, to olive oil in terms of its profile. How about drought tolerance? You know, so there's all these kinds of things that we're waiting until the, our major trader partners approve them. So we can only go as fast as they allow us. That's biotech 1.0. Those are your corn, your soybeans, uh, cotton. Biotech 2.0 is here. And those are things in countries like Bangladesh where you have uh, eggplant. Eggplant is something that um, if you go to Bangladesh or India, you might not want to eat, not because it's not delicious, because it's one of the most heavily sprayed crops. Uh, it'll get sprayed 50 or 80 times. Um, in a, in a season. And this um, was approved last year in October. This will be a game changer. Those farmers won't have to spray. There will be health benefits for the farmers, some of who don't have those protective equipment. And consumers are going to have a healthier product. There's also golden rice. You, you guys have heard of golden rice? 
That's the pro-vitamin A rice. Well, this is in field trials in the Philippines. And it's been taking a long time to get out. And the reason it's been taking a long time to get out is because sometimes the field trials have been burned. There's been a backlash against this. And remember, perception drives policy. So if a country has to stop and fight that battle, they're not able to move forward. And that's going to address, you know, billions die of blindness, of micro deficiencies like vitamin A. Those are children. So it's estimated that if uh, the rice will be able to address like 25% of those millions of deaths. I said I would get to this whole population. There's a more interesting story than there is. So there's a particular reason why now matters. So if you guys are 18, you know, in your next productive 40 years, your decisions on what you make. These we old guys, you know, forget us. But your why now matters is particularly important. Do you remember Dr. Ehrlich? Anybody in this room remember him? Doom and gloom, everyone's going to be riots in the streets and they'll be burning. And well, that would have been now, and we don't see that because I had a lovely drive out from Des Moines and I didn't see any of that. So he got it wrong. And he, there's two lessons from him getting it wrong. And I'll share, to you, uh, share with you some of the research by Dr. Hans Rosling. Have anybody ever heard of Hans? Somebody's going like Hans, no, something else? <laughs> did anybody know of Hans? Oh, you did. Isn't he great? He's awesome. So you know what Dr. Hans Rosling, some of you, was, was, was talking about. He looked at, he's a statistician, and he's a medical doctor, and he looked at all the, the data on population and fertility, and he found something very interesting known as peak child. Um, and there were two good news stories out of that. Anybody want to tell me what peak child is? From your, his, uh, your, anybody? Peak child? 2014 was the year of peak child. So peak child happened in 2014, and so it means there will never be more children born than in 2014. I'll say it again, never more children than 2014. So how can that be? Well, let me show you a bit of his data. This is 1953. The area in red are eight to nine children per woman. The area in blue is having you know, one child or less. 1950, look at what happens over time. We're at 1983. Okay, it's gradually changing, but Africa's still red. Look at 2013, almost all blue. If you fast forward to 2053, it's almost all in this area. So, peak child happened in 2014. So, if I take you back to 1960, the data showed that we had 1.1 1 .1 billion children under the age of 15, and these comprised 35% of the population. In the last couple of years, we've had 1.9 billion children under the uh, age of 15, but they represent 27% of the population. As we move to 2050, those 1.9 billion under the age of 15 are going to represent 20% of the population. So what's happening is we're, we're, we're going to become static over time. But you might be thinking, wait a minute, what about that whole big area you said we're going to rise to? Anybody know what, why that is? How do we get that if we have at peak child? Yeah, so that's the whole reason for those women having less children. Because what Dr. Ehrlich forgot to account for is the social factor. If I know my children are going to live longer, I know I can put more resources into the children I have. And if people are living longer, then that's the second good news story. So that whole area is as, as that population bump grows older. And it'll level off about 2000, I mean, yeah, 2011. So that's why now, now matters. 
If we can get to 2050 without draining our rivers dry, without burning down our forests, then agriculture or natural resources, whoever's in the mix, has saved the planet. Because getting it right now matters. After that curve, it won't matter anymore. Because if we can't get there without being sustainable, then we're stuck giving our future generation the problems, you know, inheriting a, a, a worse set of problems than we have today. So here's one of my parting thoughts for all of you. You can't tweet common sense, but you can provide a link. And so for those of you who understand agriculture, understand natural resources, you can be the links to provide information in the conversation that's going on in social media or other medias that are, that are, that are coming. My second parting thought is, and this was shared from an intern in our office who said to me one day, I can't believe it, I just realized, you know, you can do an ag job anywhere in the world and someone's going to pay me for it. So really in agriculture or in natural resources, you can really do that anywhere. In, in our embassies around the world, we have economic officers, we have political officers, but we have officers that deal with agricultural issues. We have environment, health, uh, uh, safety, uh, sorry, environment, health, science and technology officers. There's all kinds of opportunities for you around the world. If you're interested in that, we have internship programs at all levels, from being an undergrad to being a full professor. And we need the best and the brightest like you that understand science, whether it's the economics of the issue or the, uh, you know, the actual in the lab type of issue. We need you in the policy process. So that's, that's all. And thank you very, very much. And if you, I guess we have time for questions. questions. Yep. Yes, I'm sorry. Are we making any progress in getting European countries to accept genetically engineered agricultural products? Nope, we're not. I wish we were. But it's, it's an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I was just in Brussels. Um, in Europe, you know, what happened in, 19, in the mid-1990s with mad cow disease? That actually was, I think, the pivotal moment in Europe where people said, look, we trusted the same people who were going to regulate biotechnology, and they messed up here. And I think it's had that reverberating effect around the world. Um, if you talk about, to Europeans about food security, don't care. Uh, prices, don't care. Willing to pay more, and, and maybe on environment. For them, agriculture is a kind of a, a way of life. We want to preserve a way of life. What we tell them to that is, that's great, but we in, are in a global marketplace, and you're importing most of your animal feed, either from the US or Brazil or Argentina. So your environmental pr footprint is, let's say you get them from, from Brazil. You have certain sustainability standards, maybe Brazil's are not the same as yours. So, you know, you have to make decisions in a larger context. BSF left Germany because I couldn't even do research there. I wish I had an answer. Uh, I'll give you my card, and when, when you have the answer, I want you to tell me because we're still struggling. I'm sorry, the gentleman in the back. Yeah, Marcella, though, the flip of that is, is uh, maybe we've got these big buyers. Right? Who can dictate certain things? So maybe the EU can tell Brazil, you want us as a buyer, we kind of want you to do certain things for you know, environmental reasons, social reasons, whatever. whatever it is. So I, I don't know. I don't see this notion of are we making any progress in the new divide, whatever. I don't understand. You're saying you don't see the, the, the problem of, uh, you see, I, wait, I'm sorry, I don't, John. You 
well, it's a global market and mm -hmm. all this sort of thing. Yeah, it is. And so big buyers should have some say in how things are made. Ah, uh, but see, the, the whole story isn't there. The European public doesn't know that we're subsidizing their, their animal feed. That's the problem. So, oh, okay, that, that may be, but I, I still don't see that as an inherent problem in, in this market system. Except that it dictates what our farmers can do. And, and, and for, the, for, for us, that's a problem because, what's that? Yeah, our farmers have a lot more options than, than what might be for They have a lot of options, but you have companies like Syngenta who they had a, a, a product, they, they went ahead and launched, and now they have a number of lawsuits against them because they went ahead and made that decision if it wasn't an approval somewhere else. The, the, the real problem is everybody should have choices. The problem is everybody's choices affect, uh, how can I say, you're not making the decision in, in a vacuum. And, and the thing is, for Africa, who's moving with some of the fastest growing economies like Nigeria, they're going to move forward on it. But in the meantime, the point is really in the meantime as we move past this discussion and debate, you're going to um, either uh, regulate technologies that have a lot of promise out of existence or you're, you're, you're not. We have um, all kinds of, I know Iowa State's working on CRISPR, or, um, as a, as a, as a t technology. You have these very precise uh, techniques. Now, if Europe decides, as they might, um, we're going to regulate this like biotech, universities, small startup companies aren't going to be able to compete with bigger business. So what we're saying is make choice by making the right regulatory decisions, right being the right balance between risk and actual you know, hazard that's out there. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I was under the impression that we were producing enough calories now to feed the world and it was more a matter of distribution and access to information. Like with the example of the GMO banana trials, uh, if the bananas have um, will problems, uh, it's, there's other types of banana varieties that the farmers can grow and also um, if we're going to put uh, these, the GMO banana has six times more vitamin A and Ugandans are vitamin A deficient. So why don't we teach them about um, eating healthy? So I'm wondering what the Office of Agriculture um, is doing for education and um, distribution. You, you mean in terms of, of agriculture in general or what? Are yeah, in general, like, um, so are there, is the Office of Agriculture have other initiatives besides just science-based um, uh -huh. big agriculture pro projects? Oh. So like educational and teaching the people about nutrition? So we have, we have our U.S. Agency for International Development, and they talk about they talk about agroecology. They um, it talk about traditional breeding. Um, the reason that we, in particular, talk about biotechnology is because it's regulated, and getting having that discussion on regulation seems to be the sticking point in terms of making the technology available. For example, in Kenya, you have a whole host of products re waiting to come out. Same in Uganda. If the Ugandan president can't, or the agencies that weigh in to advise the president can't make a clear decision, the university work will go nowhere. Some cases, you have a solution through traditional breeding, and that's great. Um, the idea between using some of these newer technologies and biotechnology is either we can't find a solution or it's a faster way to solve the problem. It was just a tool, and somehow now it's become more than a tool, it's become a thing. But for breeder, or for, for molecular geneticists, it's just, it's just a tool. So when we go abroad, we talk about all of agriculture we have in the U.S. We're the largest agri um, organic producer in the world, 2% uh, of our agriculture. So that's also a, a, a big part of what we do in terms of working with, say, the EU or Canada on organic equivalents. Um, 
But yeah, so there's all, the, all, we need actually all of these. Actually, we need to have, I was talking to uh, Dr. Coletti, we need to have a bigger conversation um, around it rather than choose, uh, saying this tool is bad or that tool is bad. Thank you. Um, I did not see. I did not see that. Uh, tell me what it was about. Um. Well, I'm going to try to paraphrase what okay. I read. Okay. Apologies if, if I get this wrong. Um, one of the facts that they pointed out is the among scientists, those in the STEM field, it's like 89% acceptance in terms of viewing GMOs as safe. Mm -hmm. But the public, see, uh, it's like 37% see GMOs as safe. And the editorial went on to suggest that. There's a communication gap. Um, but one of the points that they brought up in the editorial is that in order to bridge that gap, uh, this is the editorial, it's not me, uh, was saying that um, industry input may not be as a non-starter. In that, and, and this is the interpretive part on my end, so I may have this wrong, but the perception that GMOs are not safe, and that, as you showed, this backlash to it, I'm wondering if that's confounded by a negative impression of the agro industry. Mm -hmm. And as you go forward to try to bridge that gap, there's both of those issues that have to be addressed. And I'm curious if that's something that the State Department thinks about and how you would address that confounding issue. We think about it all the time because that is, it's, it's an intermix of a discussion that agriculture, I would say, people are trying to have around agriculture. Genetic engineering has just gotten connected uh, to that. Um, but uh, researchers, even in the US, I have a number of friends who say, you know what, I don't do genetic engineering research. Look, it's just too expensive now to get it through our regulatory system. Okay, why is it expensive? Because of this backlash. When um, Europe asked for more data and more data and more data because of, I'd say, the you know, precautionary principle. We want to look at this, we want to look at that. You know, there's a certain level where you're, you're getting, you know, how much more do you need? And, and I'm, I'm saying this because you only now have the big companies that can afford to do that, $100 million to get a, uh, a product to market. But what's now being available, research being done at this university are products that um, if people can't separate the issues out, they're, they're going to say no to that as well without understanding. So yes, we try to deal with that and try to tease away the different issues and having that discussion um, because that's definitely, it, it's definitely there. Um, I've heard um, we want to use only organic agriculture or only this type or only that type. Well, we have a lot of, you know, what's right here may not work here, may work better here, but we're not going to feed the we're not going to feed the planet just on agriculture. That's what Africa is now. Okay, no inputs there. So the idea of uh, of, of asking them to move backwards is a non-starter. China is moving forward in terms of cloning, genetic engineering, all these different types of techniques, but they don't want to tell their people about it. They're afraid because they have all kind of food safety issues, right? And there, it's not about big business, but it's about trust in your, your, what your government can do. So, they have to have a conversation they're afraid to have. The point is, I think that we got to get people to talk about what really matters, and then let's separate fact from fiction, and then let's have a discussion that tries to be solution-based into where you want to be in terms of a sustainable, um, in terms of a sustainable, you can call it society, in terms of sustainable production. Uh, related to that, if, for example, I wanted to make a genetically modified pig that was that had enhanced growth or was heat, heat stress resistant, 
what would be the approval time in the United States and what might be the approval time in Europe or Asia or Africa? So um, if this is a genetically, you said to grow faster? Yep. So you know about GE salmon, do you? Yep. Genetically injured salmon, which has been waiting in our approval process <coughs> for, for a long time. That, your pig or that salmon would be the first in the world for eating, not, not for producing drugs. In the U.S., we regulate animals as a drug. It's not, a, um, if you're using biotechnology in crops, it's regulated differently. Um, but the FDA regulates it as a drug. So it will be the first, it'll be a, um, a, a, a it, I would say it's a difficult science decision it's a bigger de political decision in the U.S. and then around the world. So how long would it take? I don't know because we're still waiting. Would, would the U.S. be the, the fastest route to approval? Or might Maybe an not. Nation be faster? I'm sorry? Would an African nation be faster or an Asian nation? Well, maybe a South American nation might be faster. Because what's happening now is uh, Europe is taking um, – a really long time, let me say four or five years. Can you imagine? You've, you've got your product, four or five years. The U.S., a couple of years, two and a half years. Brazil, 18 months. Yeah. So who knows? What about China? <coughs> China won't look at a dossier, a package of data, until it's been approved in the U.S. So then, two and a half years here, then they'll start looking at the information. So that could be another two and a half years. So that's our problem with China, They're saying, look, can't you look at it at the same time? No. And, and I think the real underlying reason is we need the gold standard the U.S. Pr provides with our public. I'm sorry, you yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, my 21-year-old nephew approached me because he's writing an essay for, for college on GM crops. So uh, I was trying to find some information for him, so I just typed in you know, Google. And all the websites that came were, were sponsored by uh, anti-GMO uh, places that uh, used, they, they used junk science and there was fear-mongering that was uh, embedded in the whole thing. So, so I think that the... the the kids today are just being bombarded with this, this type of, of, of education. It took me a long time to find uh, sites that were that were science based. Is there is there any kind of effort to try to put money behind uh, websites that are science based that uh, that people can go to and they can they can rely on? One of my favorite is called the Genetic Literacy Project, and if you go on there, you'll find conversations with the likes of Kevin Folta, although he's recently pulled back, you'll, you'll find really interesting pieces. That is a good site to go to. Um, another one is called ISAAA, and it talks about biotechnology around the world, ISA, and it'll, it'll give information on, on what's going on in the 28 countries that now grow biotech crops. Yeah, do you need to regulate it? So we, in the U.S., we don't say it's a technique we need to regulate it. We say, is the product safe? So we look at it on a product-by-product product basis. Europe looks at it by technique. So they're saying, well, there's a whole package of technique. How do they compare to genetic engineering? Because their law um, is written in such a way so that it has to be compared. And unlike our laws, we have three regulatory agencies, FDA for food safety, EPA for environmental safety, and things like um, if you have uh, uh, BT crops that produce an insecticidal protein, and then we have USDA, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, looking at, um, you know, environmental 
types of impacts, environmental release. So we had already an ex ex existing set of regulations. We didn't have to write new regulations. So how do you regulate it? Right now you can go like on USDA APHIS and say, they have a site, am I regulated? And you can ask them some questions and they'll kind of help you feel for whether or not you need to come see them. So I don't know what will happen. I mean, why would you need, if you knock out one base pair, why, which could happen naturally, why do you need to have it regulated? Maybe you don't. So that's the conversation that's happening right now um, in Europe. And we have a product uh, from a company called Cebus that's going to go right, it's going to go through the regulatory uh, system. I believe it's corn and I believe it's ODM is the technique that they've, they've used. And um, that's what's triggering a discussion in, in Europe on, on whether or not we're going to regulate that. Well, we have a few more minutes, but let's say you thank Dr. Smith. Thank you.